Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition of Valley Talk Live. I am Jeff Crow, just like last week. Joined again by my co-host, Mr. Marcus Ruiz Evans, the acclaimed author, <laughs> who will probably plug his book again yet again. Hey, it's not a surprise if you already call me out before the show gets started. I like to do it. People don't suspect that I'm doing it. Well, all right. Well, pretend like you didn't hear that, folks, because Please. we'll. If it happens <laughs> to get snuck in there, then it does. Today we are joined by a candidate for Congress here in California, from Southern California specifically, and his name would be Mr. Pablo Kleinman. Welcome, uh, Pablo. Thank you, Jeff. From the San Fernando Valley, even more specifically, the 30th <laughs> Congressional District um, here in L.A. Great, great, great. Now, uh, let's go ahead and just start off, Mr. Kleinman, with your uh, background uh, leading up to where you are now. Well, um, let's see. You'll notice I have a little bit of an accent. I actually came to California from Argentina when I was 13 years old. Awesome. Moved here with my family and uh, moved to the west side of Los Angeles. I uh, went to middle school, high school there. Um, I graduated from the USC uh, School of International Relations, and then I decided to try out my luck in the East Coast. I moved to New York City. I worked my way up in a bunch of different jobs, and uh, I found myself in the late 90s um, working as part of a uh, group of consultants that were bringing uh, traditional uh, companies online, m more specifically financial companies in New York. So when those companies began to offer services uh, directly to their uh, clients over the Internet, I, I was involved in that. Um, and then from there on with uh, three other consultants, we left and we founded what went to be the first startup that I was involved in. That one didn't do very well. We found ourselves in the middle of trying to do our second round of funding when the Internet bubble exploded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so even though, um, and, that, and that taught me a lesson because we were, everything was going, going according to plan as far as we were concerned, but you know, there were external factors that, that uh, affect you, and in this case, it forced us to shut down uh, in early 2001. So um, from there, I decided to go to business school. I went and I got an MBA um, in Europe because I uh, wanted to use that opportunity uh, to also get acquainted with uh, how things were in other parts of the world. and. Um, and it was there that I uh, was uh, permanently and irremediably converted to market economics. <laughs> I saw um, I was in France and in the UK, and I didn't like what I saw, especially when it came to economics. Um, and oh. I was, came back convinced, even though I already had those leanings uh, before I went there, I, I came back knowing that um, the worst thing we could do was to try to emulate or imitate what they were doing over there. Um, I first moved uh, back to New York and eventually made my way back to California about five years ago. And um, I worked for a, a big uh, technology company while I was there and when I came back. And then in 2011, I founded my current venture, which is a company called Orbita, uh, and it's a network of travel-related websites, which is a small company because there are not that many of us in the company, but we have a lot of users. We, um, as of last month, we had 24 million um, visitors, so we're uh, particularly popular in emerging markets. Our products are in a whole bunch of different languages. And uh, and that's pretty much it. And besides uh, that, another thing that I've been doing, uh, especially uh, during the past 10 years, is um, in 2004, I founded uh, Diario de America, which um, right. was the first political opinion journal 
in Spanish, edited in the U.S. And I've been doing political commentary um, on the radio and, and on television since then, especially in Spanish. And for the past five years, I've been the alternate host in uh, the highest rated uh, political talk show on the Univision radio network, which is the largest Spanish language radio network in the U.S. So that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Well, wow, that is a that is one big of a nutshell there. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's awesome. That that's that's completely American dream. There, you come from Argentina as a uh, teenager. You uh, settle in Los Angeles. You end up in New York, for getting into business. Then you get your MBA in Europe, and come back to the states. And from there, you go from New York back to California, start up the, you said the first political journal in Spanish, in the Spanish language in the United States. Yeah. And, and that wow. was, a, a, I mean, some people thought it was a crazy venture to begin with, but it wasn't meant to be a, uh, an economic success. Um, I mean, that's why I was uh, working and why I had another business. I did it mostly because I, I saw the need to promote uh, these ideas in Spanish in America. And, uh, and in part, that's what's driven me to, to run for office right now. It's mostly frustration. I've been supporting Republican candidates for a long time now and i'm tired of seeing that the emphasis is put on on issues that are not the most important what i see as the most important issues as the issues that affect our daily lives um, there are issues that make for good television they make for good debate uh, but they you know when when they when they finally tackle the important things like the debt ceiling, for example, or or a national debt, or a lot of things related mostly to economics or to defense, they do it at the very last minute. They do it badly, and when they don't wait till the last minute, then we end up with stuff like Obamacare, an all-or-nothing approach that creates several problems for each problem that it attempts to resolve. So um, I'd like for us to focus on on the issues that are most important to our country today and uh, and that's why I'm running and that's why I decided to do it as a Spanish speaking Republican because here in California um, the reason why we have been losing so many elections over the years has to do with the fact that we are not appealing to a key demographic in the state which are Hispanics Yes, that is certainly one of the bigger factors, as you just mentioned. And the, yeah, the reality is, is that when you, when you, when, when, when a political party's emphasis, and I don't, I'm not judging all Republicans or any, anything like that, or all Democrats, but when, when you get in, when, when I, what I, from anecdotal evidence, when I talk to folks that are Latino, uh, such as yourself, um, just the the lay person on the street, they would they would support many issues that Republicans have, uh, and there would there's a lot of them that would support Democrat issues as well. But you're not going to get through to somebody if they believe that your primary agenda is to literally deport a member of their family and to you know on the immigration issue in particular a hot button issue and there's there's people that are solution oriented will come up with a way to to make it where most people will be satisfied with a solution, whether they be from the political right or the political left or some other side of the equation there. And they won't get everything that they want, but they'll get enough of what they are seeking to where 
they they can say hey you know what this is this is the best this is the best example of of compromise and that that there is and especially on a tough issue like that and but but you see, Jeff, for a lot of people, compromise has become a bad word. Yes. And uh, I mean, that's how things get done at the end of the day. Is um, And I'm not saying that you have to compromise your values or your beliefs, but you find common ground with people that think differently, and you end up finding a solution to a problem where, um, you know, you meet the other person somewhere along the road that separates you and, and, and you, and you solve an issue. Otherwise nothing gets done. Right. Exactly. If, if, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan, who a lot of Republicans obviously look up to once said that if somebody agrees with you 80% of the time, that person is not your enemy. Right. And, he himself signed a bill called the Immigration Reform Control Act in 19, uh, excuse me, 86, 1986, right? which yeah. allowed amnesty for those in this country illegally. And in exchange, the, the border was supposed to be enforced heavier and whatnot. That part did not get it was never put into motion despite the law and even pete wilson the governor who has been the poster child of of uh of of the so-called anti-immigration movement actually as a senator did vote for urca as it was called he did support it he voted for it and in 1994 changed his view in part um i've read some of his writings on that in part because he saw that it was not that the other part the enforcement part was not being was not was not happening and didn't that no one had the political will to do it now it sounds like you have you're the type of guy because you get things done you've proven it in private industry that you would get th you, you if a bill passes or is proposed not only would you probably have good solutions to these issues tough issues not just immigration there's a lot of other issues out there like you said with health care and other things that you would you 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 would want to see that the entire package is enforced so we don't have you know, or other areas, other other types of issues, so that we don't have to keep having these same discussions over and over again, and we can move forward as a society. De definitely, and and see, I I'm running in a district that the Democrats have held for over a generation. We haven't even gotten close to winning this in a long time, um, but it's a middle class district. It's a middle and upper middle class district. It's a district where 40% of the people were born outside of the United States. And of the remaining 60%, uh, most of them are either the children of these immigrants or are people that have moved from other parts of the country in search of the American dream. So um, there's no reason why this district should be represented by a Democrat that votes 95% the party line. Um, this is this is a non-traditional district, and it should be represented by a candidate that um, answers to uh, the views of the constituents here, not uh, a party line candidate. So I think I have a pretty good chance of winning because I am running against someone that's been there for a long time and doesn't do anything. He talks a lot. He panders. He's a master in pandering, but um, he has no real achievements to show. Is is this uh, what you mean by uh, when you claim that you are a new generation Republican? Well, what I mean by a new generation Republican is that um, I am modern when it comes to social issues, and by modern I mean that I agree with most of the newer generations and with people my age as well. And, uh, and also, uh, I am fiscally conservative, and I don't think that we should be forced to choosing between uh, two packages that contain only 50% of what we want. I think that most of the people here 
a large majority of the people that live here agree with me on all issues, not on some of the issues. But yet there's never an alternative that proposes what I'm proposing. So a new generation Republican is a Republican that um, wants to focus on um, the most important issues that our country faces. Is a Republican that sees the Republican Party as being the party of freedom, the party of, of uh, individual responsibility, the party of personal choices. It's the it's the party that above all um, wants us to go back to our essence which is the republican party as the party of freedom so uh, i'm reading here in an article uh is there a pulse in the california gop by jennifer rubin in washington post in 2014 where you talk about being a new generation republican and you summed it up as i'm socially moderate and fiscally conservative when you're talking about issues that are most important i think what i'm i'm hearing from you is that we're in a recession. We're in the worst recession the world's seen in about a century. California's the worst hit state in all of America. And parts of California are, have the highest rates of unemployment in the entire country. And you want to talk about something other than jobs and how to get the economy back on track and the debt ceiling and making sure that we're managing our finances? Yeah, it does seem totally irrelevant. Is, is that close to your ideology, I guess, for lack of a better phrase? Pretty much so, and, and I have to admit that I also believe that national defense is a, is a very important and, and is a core issue, and it's probably the most important core issue that's not related necessarily to the economy. Um, although our weak economic situation is harming our national defense because it put, puts us in a uh, mm -hmm. weaker position internationally. But yes, I think that we have to focus on the economy. We have to focus on jobs. We have to focus on the things that would make a difference and that can change um, us for the better. And that's also why I'm talking so much about school choice or real school choice the way I, I define it because um, education is directly linked to opportunity and we have to go back to being the land of opportunity. Um, a lot of people are very concerned about uh, income inequality and uh, they want to pick winners and losers, they want to resolve it um, by law. And this is not something that we're going to resolve by law. Income inequality is true. It can be a problem, but the way to resolve income inequality is to make sure that everybody has the skills to be able to have a better paying job. And those jobs that a lot of people criticize, you know, like working at a, at a fast food restaurant, for example, have to go back to being entry-level jobs that um, adolescents or, 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 or people just entering the workforce go into, not people that have a family to support. Um, so, you know, the solution is not to pay $25 to somebody making burgers at McDonald's, but the solution is for uh, – grown-ups for people that are already supporting a family to have the skills not to have to go get a job at McDonald's. That's, that's well said. Um, you have started a couple different companies, uh, Fidonet, Sabueso, uh, Diario, Diario de America, El Medio, Californiana Foundation, and Orbita. And you've traveled a bit, and you've studied, I believe, at the London so, School. So Fidonet was not a company. It was actually a, a nonprofit effort by volunteers. Um, this was pre-Internet, and uh, and it was definitely not a company, and I didn't start it. It was an international network, and I was just the one that started the Latin American branch of it. Okay. Um, but this was the first email network in Latin America back in the 80s when uh, I was a teenager. Okay. Okay. Uh, You've been around a bunch of large organizations, some of which have been companies, and you have studied economics. I believe at the it was the London School of Economics at the. Um, I studied business um, at two schools in Europe. One is called HEC, which is the number one business school uh, in Europe, and is is just outside of Paris, and then at the London Business School. Okay, so we're having a lot of talk about the recession, and. You have a good economics background, uh, personal experience, professional um, training. Uh, there was a lot made of the March jobs report, and there was kind of talk about how America's totally out of the recession and everything's just fine. 
Well, I was looking at your website, and you had a quote on there under the topic jobs and economy. By the way, I recommend everybody check out uh, Pablo Kleinman's uh, website. Lots of good material. Uh, but I want to quote something you said. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics recently found that California, with some of the highest levels in the country of taxation and red tape, ranks at the very bottom in job creation and employment. In your opinion, is California out of the recession? Is everything okay? Are we on the right track? Uh, are we totally fine? Are jobs going to come flowing back? Uh, people are talking like uh, everything's okay and we've, uh, we're totally out of the recession. In fact, I've seen some articles saying that we are officially out of the recession, but I got to tell you, I have a lot of friends who are still unemployed. I, I don't see it. So from your experience, professional, um, personal, academic, do you think California is still in the recession? Is it going to get out? Is it out? Or if not, how soon will it get out? I think that the uh, economic situation in the entire country is terrible, and I think California is leading when it comes to terrible. Okay. Just a few days ago <laughs> here in Los Angeles, we saw the announcement that uh, Toyota, which came here in 1957, is leaving um, their marketing office offices which employ several thousand people um, and it's a couple of million square feet I believe of, of office space in the city of Torrance um, in LA County they're leaving for Dallas they're 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 saying goodbye to California and they're done and they're one of um, I believe 60 plus companies that uh, Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, is boasting he got to move from California to Texas in the past 18 months. This is terrible. And this is what we're doing to these companies. California used to have one of the largest industrial bases in the nation. We used to have one of the largest uh, car, I mean, some of the largest car manufacturing plants. We used to make planes. We, all those heavy industries have left. And uh, what are we doing? We have a big agricultural sector, as you guys know. You're right there, and and we're boycotting it with um, out of control uh, regulation. And uh, the same thing is happening to other industries. Uh, these are white-collar jobs, they're non-polluting jobs that we're also driving out of the state because we have such high taxation levels. We have um, much more regulation and red tape than many other states, not just Texas, but many others. And um, Governor Brown and, and the Democrats in the states haven't I mean, they they don't get it. They don't get it. The, the statement coming from the governor's office after Toyota announced that they were leaving had to do with the green, um, you know, we, I mean, first of all, this was a marketing office. They weren't making cars here. But even those so-called green um, car manufacturers like Tesla, they're not going to locate the, their battery manufacturing plant in the state. They're looking to do it in Nevada or somewhere else. So um, even a lot of these California companies, they're forced to locating many of their facilities in other states because of the unfriendly business climate in California. What do we have in California still? We have the startup industry in California. We have the tech industry not just in Silicon Valley, but in different parts of the state. And, um, and if things continue this way, we're going to, to start driving them out uh, as well. And uh, what's going to happen? The, the, the whole income inequality issue comes when you drive out the uh, good middle-class jobs that these companies create. And so you're left with a lot of people receiving public assistance, and then you have a lot of millionaires that basically foot the bill, but uh, they're, you know, they're making their money with uh, technology or with Hollywood, things like that. But it's um, California's uh, destroying the middle class, essentially. Huh. Uh is this what they mean by the Texas economic miracle? I saw on your site you were talking a little bit about how our main competitors, not China. It's Texas. We're losing jobs to Texas. What is it that, and I think you hinted on this a little bit, what is it that Texas is doing, besides being another large state and having a large, sizable economy, 
Wh what is it that they're doing? What are the top two things that the Texas economy is getting and is doing that the California state economy is not doing? And, and yeah. Texas is taxing less and it's regulating less. Texas is telling companies to come, we welcome you. California, whenever a company gets set up, they descend upon that company and try to make sure that they're complying with a myriad of regulations and they tax them more. And uh, I mean, Texas is a very business friendly environment and it's not just Texas. There are many other states that are like that. Texas is the larger of the states that are doing that. Um, and then um, Texas is a right to work state. That's, that's another issue. Uh, the, the unions in California sway a lot of power and, um, and they uh, invest a lot of money uh, trying to make sure that they retain that power. And I'm running precisely against the main sponsor of the anti right to work um, legislation in Congress. Brad Sherman, the Democrat that I'm running against, the one that I'm trying to retire after 18 years, he is bankrolled by the unions, and to pay them back, he presented a bill where he tried to make California more competitive by making Texas and other states, the 24 states that have right to work laws, um, he tried to outlaw those those laws and and. Uh, so he wanted to make us more competitive, wow. not but by making us more competitive, but by making others less competitive. All right. Well, uh, this is part one of a series of interviews that we plan on having with Mr. Kleinman. In the last minute here, Mr. Kleinman, please, by all means, let our audience know how to get a hold of you, your web address, and anything that yes, you might want to add. Yes, we have a website. It's voteforpablo.com. For those that <laughs> prefer to uh, look at the Spanish language version of it, it's voteporpablo.com. <laughs> and there you'll find our contact information. And uh, we are looking for supporters. We're looking for donors. We're looking for volunteers. So, um we welcome everyone that wants to help us get to Washington and start changing things there. Thank Absolutely. you very much for the opportunity of, of being on your show today. Absolutely. And again, folks, it is voteforpablo.com. And you can also look him up on Facebook, and he will gladly talk to you there. We've got about 15 seconds left here before we switch over to our next guest, City Councilman, current City Councilman Blong Zhang. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Kleinman. We will have you back very soon. Thank you, Pablo. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Now, to transition over here to uh, we, we have Blong Zhang. And uh, Mr. Blong Zhang is the current city councilman for District 1 in Fresno. And he is running for the uh, supervisor, county supervisor, District 1 seat that is uh, being vacated, I believe, by Mr. Phil Larson. That's correct. And uh, thank you for having me here, Jeff. Oh, great to, great to have you here, uh, Mr. Zhang. And, uh, uh, please, uh, Blong. Yeah. <laughs> they just uh, call you know me Blong, all right? Okay. They, uh, hey, that's right. Uh, okay. In fact, <laughs> I've right, seen the campaign right. signs. They're right. <laughs> they just call me. They, you know, the, nice and simple, my friend. They, Blong. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, uh, well let's just start off, uh, Blong, by you telling us a little bit about yourself. I appreciate it. I mean, I, I had a chance to listen to your previous guest, uh, uh, Pablo and, and you know and I get a chance to hear uh, his version of the American dream and so uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna add add my version into that and and I think that's what uh, this country is all about is giving opportunities to to immigrants to refugees to to people that care about this country yes and uh, mine started uh, you know closely right after the Vietnam War our, our Hmong communities tied to to the Vietnam veterans and uh, you know when when the U.S. pulled out of that. Uh, a lot of our folks uh, that fought for for the United States and with the United States uh, was in danger, uh, and so as a communist uh, country uh, was being taken over, uh, and uh, they were going after those that were loyal or fought with the United States. Uh, obviously, our community uh, was uh, heavily targeted, 
Um, our family uh, left uh, the country, escaped uh, across uh, the river, the Mekong, uh, settled in Thailand in, a, in the first refugee camp there called Ban Binai, and was there for a period of time. And then was very fortunate enough when uh, the U.S. did the resettlement uh, that we were part of the, uh, the wave that came uh, to the United States in, in, in 76. Uh, so coming uh, from a, a pretty uh, warm climate uh, during that time and then landing in Kirksville, Missouri during the Christmas holiday. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> so right. Went, went from a warm climate to uh, probably the bitter cold uh, in just a matter of a snap of a finger uh, to a different culture, to, to a different uh, uh, community, uh, basically a fourth world country, as I would call it, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to at the time, and it still is, one of the most advanced country uh, in, in the world. And for many of us, uh, the stories uh, for our community was that America was a, a country paved with gold, streets of gold. Mm. Uh, it had salt all over the place. It was abundancy, and you can have whatever uh, you want. So um, we, we came here. Uh, you, you know, and uh, uh, my my parents, uh, my my father, who was in the military, uh, our first job uh, was washing dishes uh, at the Holiday Inn. Hmm. Uh, a, a far cry from what he was used to, but that was an opportunity, and uh, we were um, assisted uh, with some of the social programs that was available. Uh, live uh, in the Midwest, you know, Missouri to, to Kansas to Wisconsin for the first eight year. Actually, grew up in the Midwest. Uh, and then came huh. out uh, to uh, after I graduated college in '91. Has been here in California and Fresno since, and um, love the love the valley, and love the state, and um, and I've been blessed and fortunate to do a lot of work here um, and do a lot of community work. And uh, in 2007 was uh, was humbly uh, um, elected to to serve as as a council uh, representative for District One and for the city of Fresno, and. Um, Time passes uh, by fairly quickly, uh, you know, when you're having fun, right? Eight years has gone by since 2007. So, uh, looking uh, as uh, at, at the board of supervisor, and, and I hope that our community continues to to support me, and, and hopefully, I've done a, a fair enough job that they said that you know we're going to give you another opportunity to serve our, our community. I yeah, and l let me just say that the the story of the Hmong people is an exceptionally sad one. There's something that Americans need to look into. Our history was not totally clean by the way that these people were treated by us in the Vietnam War. They really went to bat for the American soldier. For sure. And we could have done a better job in treating them during the time where they were military partners and in bringing them over here. We were a little bit belated about that, and that's not okay. Um, the Hmong people are... A unique situation they're what's called a stateless people a large yes. ethnic group that should basically have their own nation <laughs> I'll just go ahead and say it the Hmong people over in Southeast Asia deserve their own nation they don't and that's part of the problem here uh, you have the Kurds over in uh, the Middle East etc so uh, tough situation tough situation you made it over here now there are two Hmong communities in America, as I understand it, yes. primarily. Uh, there is the, Major ones. There is the California one. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Min Minnesota, Minnesota right? one. Minnesota. So, so I'm sorry. We're, we're a little biased here, but, uh, uh, but uh, try not to give an unbiased answer uh, or try to give it. <laughs> what, what, <clears throat> why, what's the difference between um, for Hmong people in California versus uh, well, Minneapolis. Uh, and, funny you say that because I, I was giving a, a, a speech in Willow, Willow International the other day speaking a little bit about that. And uh, you would think, right, as, as, as our community coming from a, a pretty warm climate, farming is, is our background, farming is our life, farming is, is what we do, that you would believe that the California climate, the West Coast climate would be where we would settle and where we would be. But actually, when when they uh, when the initial resettlement happened, and at that time resettlement was done through uh, the churches or Catholic charities and okay. so forth, so the church was the main sponsor of getting families to to this country. Oh, so the church that sponsored us was out of the Midwest. And okay, so that's how part of the group ended up in in the Midwest. The other thing with in the Midwest was that there at that time there was a lot of uh, assembly jobs that were available that didn't require a lot of education, but good hand skills, right? And so the, we were good with our hands. Okay. And, and so, uh, so what kept our Minnesota folks at the time was the jobs that was available, with our hands, and that kind of stayed. So that built a, a stronger economic base in terms of jobs, and, and that's why you see a large population in the Midwest, especially in Minnesota. Now in the West Coast, the the first uh, wave actually didn't settle in the Central Valley. There were uh, in Southern California, and possibly even in Northern, you know, Orange County and, and and San Diego. 
they didn't come into the Central Valley probably until the mid 80s. And you saw a big, huge rush uh, of mm -hmm. folks. It, it, was, it was almost as though, like in 83, 84, five, 10, 15 families, right? Mm -hmm. you, the, it, the community, oh, just, just a small group come in. Well, it, it just blew up overnight. And you had a community come here, families to families, talking, this is the place, the great farming, Central Valley, great weather. Mm. And then all of a sudden, at its peak, you had close to 50,000 monks in the mm. Fresno County area. Mm -hmm. And that put a lot of strain to the social service mechanism to, to the Central Valley because they didn't expect this group this quickly coming here. And that's what we, we called, at least for us when I was doing community work, secondary migration. Money from the feds, money from the feds went to the first location, right? Mm -hmm. So they ended up in Kirksville, Missouri. That's where they went. But our family only stayed there for, for one year. And I'll tell you, we were the only family in Kirksville, Missouri. My dad, whether he knew how to use the phone or not, put the word out, said, where is the rest of my people? Right, where, where, where did we settle? Where, 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 where were the rest of the, my people in the refugee camps that came over here? It ended up in Kansas City, Kansas. A year later, we picked up and go. Said we're going to go to where the people were, but the money didn't necessarily follow the secondary migration. Interesting. And that's where the challenges were. Interesting. Yeah, I remember I was in grade school, uh -oh. and uh, uh -oh. I remember at the time <laughs> that uh, my my uh, the area that I grew up at, uh, West and Clinton area. Yes. The, yes. The uh, heart of District 1, well, kind of. Well, every part's the heart. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, um, I remember my fifth or sixth grade year, all of a sudden there was a lot of Southeast Asian mm -hmm. students, and we really had a great time, uh, you know, getting to know uh, these folks. And, and uh, you know, at the time our school was primarily – you know, 40% Caucasian, 40% Latino. Right. That was the breakdown of the neighborhood. And then African Americans. And then the Asians traditionally in the neighborhood were Japanese. Right. Or uh, Chinese. Some Chinese. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, it was a different, uh, uh, different ethnic groups right. from all over Southeast Asia. And so we learned very quickly about the cultures. We talked to the kids that we met and, it was great. We it was awesome. They we had, we had a great time. We they started riding skateboards with us and <laughs> riding bikes and you know just you know just totally acculturating to to Americanism. We were we learned a lot and I remember I met as I as I got older when I would meet people from out of California uh, away from California and not from St. Paul, Minneapolis either. And I would uh, say, uh, you know, when you get here, I will. We're gonna have a gathering. There'll be a lot of different types of folks: Hispanics, Mongs. They're like, hold on, hold on. What's a Mong? <laughs> exactly. And, and I, <laughs> yes, I, I'm sorry, I've heard that. I story. heard that question so many times. <laughs> sorry. And uh, and I would explain, and then, okay, I thought that with the Vietnam War, it was uh, Vietnamese people that fought. Well, no. And that, that showed a gap in Amer the American educational system to leave out, really, that's what they did, left out an entire group of people who fought bravely, fought tough. Um, I remember meeting, I met General Vang. Uh, General Vang. Really? A number of, oh yeah, I met him back in 2002 through uh, some uh, gentlemen I knew uh, in the Hmong community as well as uh other folks in the political community, uh, General Vang was quite the leader for the Hmong community as it transitioned into America. And, you know, there, 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 were, there's a lot of untold great stories about bravery, valor, and fighting for the U S flag right alongside the, you know, the American boys that did. No. Too. And, 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 you know, the, uh, as I've, as I've talked with many veterans from our side and even those veterans from, from, from the U.S., uh, you, you know, th those veterans that, that fought there, that, that uh, fought with, with our, our community, they have this really um, interesting connection, a very interesting connection. Uh, it's yes. so tight-knit and close-knit 
and that the veterans feel for for the Hmong soldiers and the Hmong veterans, it's pretty unique. And and, and I've been uh, uh, I've been awed uh, by by that relationship. I, I mean, look, I I was what five. The war was going on. You know, it was a, sure. was a child was a product of that war. Uh, but but to 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 see how those relationship, the the memories and and and, and the bond that mm-hmm. that the the Vietnam vets have with the community it, it's it's incredible to do even see it now when when I can participate in some of the veterans activities the stand downs and and, and uh, just seeing the the two groups of soldiers together it's 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 a unique experience yeah absolutely and that's one of the one of the few positive things of 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 America's wars is that it creates social change World War II, the army was segregated, but at, you know General Patton in particular, during the Battle of the Bulge, Germany Germans do a surprise attack, and America wasn't so sure. Maybe mm-hmm. they aren't defeated quite yet, and you know Patton uh, insisted that anybody from the U.S. Uh, you know join in to the U.S. Third Army. And they were like, well, all we have are what they called colored troops back then. Mm-hmm. Well, he yeah. said, right. hey, I don't give a, and I'm sure you some <laughs> colorful language, right. who, you know, who is available. It can, they can hold a rifle. They're brave men. They will fight. They will do it, you know, and part of, you know, in a lot, a lot, a lot of the, my, I had a family member who passed away recently who did fight under Patton, and he said flat out that that the Caucasian troops that that uh, were used to segregation uh, saw how African Americans would fight bravely, and even and and. There was also a, a Japanese unit in World War II that was sent to Europe. One of the most decorated uh, the unit. The most, yes. That's right, that's right. Uh, one of the most decorated u- right. unit, and, uh, and, 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 and we already know their story. Right. right? Being, uh, uh, being interned here in their own country, uh, yeah. that where, where they weren't uh, trusted as Americans, and yet um, their, their children or, or those that have agreed to fight for a country that didn't necessarily fought for them. Yes. Uh, and, and so that that is... Um, you, you know, those are the bad part of, of our, our of our country, but there's also the good part as well. And, and what America is, as I said, is, you know, we heard a Pablo story, part of that American story, um, and then uh, you know, part of mine. But but America has been blessed with so many American stories that I think, uh, you, know, you know, at least for for me, well, we're part of that fabric, and we we bring a little piece of our community, our culture. We add it to to making America uh, great, because uh, you know I. I honestly believe that, the, that this is the best country, the greatest country in the world. I've had opportunities to travel uh, outside this country, mm. and, and, mm. and I will tell you, uh, you know, no matter of all the negatives that we may say about ourselves, right? Right. Well, when you go outside of the country, you get to appreciate how others see our country, and they they they're not saying, "Oh, I don't want to go." The majority say, "We would love to go. We we, huh. we want to be in America." Uh, it's not like uh, you know us uh, over here where we take it for granted. And that's what what I see, and so I'm proud to, to as I've said, to, to be an American citizen, and to say this is my country. Exactly, and and you know, with with the right. Uh, right. with 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 that situation in World War II, shortly thereafter, a few years after the war, the army was desegregated, and as far as uh, African Americans and Caucasians, later on uh, with with uh, Vietnam. You know, uh, the it was well desegregated by then, and you know, but we and we had uh, Hispanic soldiers, we had uh, plenty of Caucasian and, and African American troops fighting in that war. But we also had, like we were educating. I, I, I we have a smart audience, but I'm sure <laughs> there are some folks that don't know that there was an ex- extreme bravery, and. So for those people who would say, and I and I used to hear this, and this is unfortunate that people developed these attitudes back then. Oh, these people are coming over here and they're getting welfare. They're getting things like that. They didn't understand that 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 any assistance for refugees, especially at that time, it was paid for in blood. Yes, it was paid for in blood, and it was not something that that. 
that anybody that that most folks in the community were planning on having forever they were just like anybody else they wanted upward mobility and this is the country that can provide it and you're a prime example no, and i appreciate that and, and i've always been appreciative of, of of the opportunities that this country gave i mean without this system without the help of, our, of, of, of of families of organizations of the government but more importantly of neighbors like yourself that care about the, the hmm. new community yeah that uh, you know I, i've done many speaking uh, engagements around uh, not only here in California but outside as well and I said that one of the best thing that that we can do to help help people transition to become Americans to become productive Americans and, and to to want to to participate civically is, is is how our neighbors treat each other right and and so when when you have Americans our neighbor Americans welcome this new group of refugees, right, and say, welcome mm -hmm. to this country. Uh, you know, let's bring you in. Let's have, what, what do you need? What can we do? This is part of what we, we think is important. That helps the transition so much quicker than any other program. Right. When, when, when you are welcome. Perfect. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, and that's part of, and it kind of leads to, to some of the political stuff, is, is that's what I was raised upon. That, that's what I was raised upon, you know, that foundation of, of how our, our, our community, or at least how I felt America is treated, uh, to me and our community giving opportunities working hard and so this is the same thing that I, that I, I'm an advocate for every single day when I have a chance to, to serve this community and serve the city is that I want to give everybody the same chance that this country gave me and and hopefully that they take that opportunity and become a better person and be productive be civically engaged and contribute back to to this great nation of ours exactly now Let's get into. Uh, we have about uh, eleven minutes left. <laughs> the hard so let's, questions. Let's uh, let's, let's, go. let's let's get into. You know what what uh, what goals? What plans do you have? What would you like to see happen? Should uh, you know? Should you have the privilege of serving us as Fresno County District uh, well, Supervisor it, it, One? And and that just goes. To, I think uh, tails in, into the work that that I've done here at the at City Hall. Uh, and representing, uh, you know, the, the the largest city in the Central Valley, the yes. fifth largest, yeah, uh, in the in, whole state, in, 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 yeah. The, yeah, in the whole state, and, and that is uh, to uh, to be engaged to to make those tough decisions. As, uh, and I heard you talk about earlier. We were, and uh, we still are, to a certain point, was in the one of the most difficult economic yes. challenges that our nation has faced. But when you put our nation, you put the state, and then you put the Central Valley. The Central Valley is almost. Uh, the the most hard hit. Yes, yes, sir. And, and so mm. to to yeah. to have served uh, the city during this time and to to work collaboratively with with with, with the two mayors that, that I've been fortunate to serve to work with uh, council members to get us to where we are. And, and as you know, I mean, the last seven years has been about making tough decisions. Yes. So that the, so that's one thing that, that the board of supervisors shouldn't be worried about me is making tough decisions uh, as, as yeah. to what needs to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, needs, needs what to happen. Right. And, and then to, uh, to continue that uh, in working with all the other cities that, that I've had the opportunity to work with uh, through, through the city as well, through COG, you know, our Council of Government, those are important relationships that has to happen because at the end of the day, the, the county of Fresno is about 15 cities, right? Sure. And, and, and the yeah. city of Fresno is, mm. even though it's the largest, we represent about half of the population, or we're right. 500,000, but 14 other cities represent the other half. So right. what what experience do do we bring in working with that and and I've been blessed as I've said in, in the eight years not to only represent the district but not only to represent our city, but I've had to work actually with all those uh, representative to move our city forward. Whether we're fighting about water, right? Whether we're, we're yes. fighting for yes, water, sir. or w whether we're fighting about immigrations, we talked about that as well. Or whether we're 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 working through COG to make sure that we're getting our fair share of taxes that we pay. Thank you. Right. To, to the state and to the feds. Yeah. Hey, we, we pay our fair share. We need it here, right, to, to, to build our roads, to do our infrastructures, to, to do the things that we have to do, uh, you know, that, that is important. So all those experience matters, uh, especially when, when you're going to go from uh, a 500,000 uh, governing, and I say governing in, in this way. Governing is actually having to work to represent that large population, to moving yes. towards over a million folks here. Okay, that that makes it a, not sitting on a commission or not sitting on a board. Uh, sure. Those are difference. That there's a difference between sitting on those because I sit on a lot of those boards. Okay? Yeah. Remember, I sit on a lot of the boards, commission as well. But when you've actually had to govern, that's a huge difference. That okay. forces you to make some tough decisions. Okay. Yeah, it's it looks really nice on a campaign pamphlet to say I sat on this uh, 
this commission or that commission but you know, there's that's nothing compared to actually having to make tough decisions well, you, that you, you know when we talk about running for office right and and so this is i i don't want to say it's cynical but you know i remember at one time i was i was a a, a, a neophyte candidate right? <laughs> I was running for office and i and i hear it all the time well you know i'm i'm gonna make this change i'm gonna do this i'm gonna right, actually right, go right. promise this and, and, and you know i i remember um uh I think the B came in one day and, and talked, well, you have a lot of new council members here and they, they're looking to, you know, they want to make all this change. And I said, well, it's good for them. I hope they know how to work collaboratively because, you know, if they can't count to four, then they're not going to get anything done. At the end of the That's day, right. you're going to have to work collaboratively with your council to move things forward. You you can be the best advocate. You can pontificate every time you're on there. But if you don't know how to get along, if you don't know how to collaborate, you don't know how to move items through. Amen. Then then you, you can be the most effective speaker but the most ineffective governor, governance of your district or, or of the city. That's, right. That's what we have. I mean, uh, you, Jeff, you keep bringing up that Reagan is an icon of conservatives. And yet Reagan said, I will work with uh, Tip O'Neill, I believe. Yeah, there, 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 he did a lot of the house had, at the time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and we have uh, the most polarized electorate and elected and appointed politicians nationwide in this country's history. There's been a bunch of studies, a bunch of news articles coming out about that. Uh, we have people who will not work together or talk to each other. Uh, our, our previous guest was talking about our rankings. You know, we went from a triple A credit ranking to a two A credit mm -hmm. ranking by the World Bank when we couldn't pass our budget. Yeah. And what the World Bank said was, it's not the Democrats' fault. And it's not the Republican Party's fault. It's everybody's fault. It's the American politicians' fault. They will not work together. You both took way too long to get a budget deal passed. Nobody's willing to compromise or to govern or to reach across the aisle or to do the difficult things it takes. It's about sound bites. And we lost our credit rating because of this. Yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, look, look, so here's the other example. We, we talk about our water issue, right? And remember in 2000 and nine eight we yeah had the water 2009 drop, right? That's yes when we had our, our our initial huge impact of 50 percent plus unemployment in the west side right and and i remember uh you, you know uh being up in the governor's office with a lot of our electors are fighting for water then i remember doing the water march right yeah from mendota to fireball yeah i, I walked that uh, that brutal stretch right and then i remember even going up to the san luis president when the governor came out and gave a speech and you know change and did all those things Nothing has changed then, right? No, nothing. And, and, now, yeah. and, and now we're coming back full circle, mm -hmm. full circle mm -hmm. to, to, to another drop mm -hmm. and, 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 and to, 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 to see where we are. And I had a, a chance to talk with a folk. I said, look, you know, I, 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 I'm a locally elected official. I, I, I don't have the privy of thinking about state and federal stuff. I got to deal with local issues here. Yeah. And I got to make yeah. sure that, 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 that we're serving our local folks. And I said, here we are, full circle again. But the big difference now is you look at you look at our, our mindset in terms of California, and it looks like, based upon some of the numbers that are out there, that we're, we as a community are ready to move towards passing a water bond. Huh. We're, 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 we're looking at that we're gonna get the majority, and yet we're still fighting over what? How many water bond versions that we have from six point yeah. nine to eleven billion dollars? Here we are. If we cannot move ourselves across the aisle and get a water bond to where the people will pass, then we've shot ourselves in the feet again. And yes. that's them to be the that's the challenge right now for for us is that we have now a second chance at, at this drought issue with a long term water solution here that that can get us through. Uh, but here we are still having kind of the same divisive debate yes and it doesn't have to be some of these some of the issues are not inherently divisive but it seems like you get these right. issues where I, I won't point out any specific issue but it, it if if president bush at the time if he had instituted the idea mm-hmm the Democrats would automatically yes. say it's bad. Mm -hmm. President Obama, let's say he had instituted the exact same idea. Right. The Republicans would say, oh, this is bad. It, it's, it, 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 it could be the same exact, <laughs> exact proposal. But because that other guy did it, 
We don't want him to get credit for it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Even though, yeah. it's, even right. though it's the <laughs> right. best, even though it's the best for for our nation, even though it's the best for our valley. But right. but no, it's because somebody else brought it. You know, it's because right. the the Dem brought the water bond, or no, because the Republican brought the water bond, and it's going to work. We, we don't want it because it's part of that. And and I think that's that's very uh, short sighted. Uh, again, sure. as I've said, we have an opportunity to to move this water bond. The number shows positiveness. We just need our, our, our elected officials at the state to, 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 to get together and, and put a water bond package out there where the people, I believe, is ready. And, and you know how long We're it's more taken than us in the valley? It, it's taken us two droughts to get the rest of the state to see what yeah. how important we in the valley are and to make sure that water should be allocated here. Then we should be able to, to, to feed not only this valley, not only this great state, not only the nation, but the world. The breadbasket. Yes, that's, that's, that's yes. what we are. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, and here we are trying to figure out uh, the, so many versions of it and the billions of dollars. Uh, look, I, I just I honestly I honestly do believe that, that we have the, 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 the intelligence to really get this done. And, and, and you can see the package there. Yes. It, it's just like, as you said earlier, uh, just reach across to Al, please. And, somehow. And, <laughs> yeah, somehow. absolutely. Find, find a way. Find, find a find way. Find a way. And, and I think uh, our, our, our valley would be the better for it. Our state would be the better for it uh, because this, this issue should not um, – it, it should be a priority as, as much as, as we talk about immigration should be a priority. Um, but we try to, uh, to pit both against the other. Right. And that's not what it is. And, not and one or yeah, the other. It exactly. Is not. And also, the uh, the good is not the enemy of the perf- of the perfect. And, yes. And you know what what you can get accomplished, you cert- certainly should. We're gonna have you back on, and we're gonna probably have you back on a lot more <laughs> in throughout no uh, up till through November. Now, uh, go ahead and in the last minute and a half, let everybody know. How can they help out Mr. Blong Jong? Well, l- let me hit this out. Absentee ballots are here. Folks, right. uh, you know, in terms of our state, we, we know that for the June primary, our number is going to turn out low. It's expected at 30%. Okay. Well, you know, in the Central Valley, if, if, if statewide is 30, we're going to be even lower. We're probably going to be somewhere between 25, 27. Certainly. Right? So that means that, that voter turnout is extremely important, folks. This is one of those uh, few given rights that we don't appreciate here in this country. But I'll tell you, outside the other country, not too many people have a voice. So right. we need to take advantage of this. Whatever party it is you belong to, please, this is something that we worked so hard. and We, we, we fought and we died for. Yeah. And, and, and so when those absentee ballots Amen. come out, just take it, put it, take it out, mark, and please vote. But at least in my case, they just call me Blong, so vote for Blong uh, for Fresno County Board of Supervisor District One. And 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 what's what's the web address? Uh, BlongforSupervisor.com. BlongforSupervisor.com. All right, we're down to about twenty seconds. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm going to look forward to coming back and having a, a more in-depth discussion with you about uh, you know where, where the campaign, some of the bigger issues that we're talking about. But I I, I thoroughly enjoyed this introduction piece uh, and, and the great work that you guys are doing and getting out great information to to our community. All right, well, awesome. We'll be back next week, folks.